uh, the situation was, for, for most, of, uh, most of our presentation anyway, the situation was that the search space itself was a linear space, uh, let's say Rn, finite dimensional linear space. Okay, and that, that's just what you happen to be optimizing on. And, and that's a given. Then the choice that we often make, uh, and certainly was the case uh, throughout the morning, is that we may decide that we're going to endow Rn with additional structure, uh, namely make it a Euclidean space, give it an inner product, for example, just you know, U transpose V, the usual. And uh, the reason we might decide to do so is because if we do, if the cost function is sufficiently differentiable, then uh, this is going to afford us very useful concepts like the, the concept of the gradient of a function and the Hessian of a function. And uh, you have these uh, you know, reminders at the bottom right of, of how those things are defined. Okay, and, and uh, once we have those concepts, then we can use them for algorithmic purposes and define things like gradient descent and Newton's method. And, you know, all of this is now uh, uh, fresh in, in our minds. Okay, so, so this is just one perspective on what's going on there. You start with the linear space, but then you decide to make it a Euclidean space. And, and the same thing is going to happen when uh, you're optimizing on a nonlinear space, which um, um, may, however, be you know, a, a smooth nonlinear space. So in this situation, what you have is that you're trying to minimize a function f, which associates a real number to every point of a set m. And I'm going to assume throughout the presentation that the set m is in fact a smooth manifold, right? And so it just means that it, it's, it may be nonlinear, but it doesn't have any kinks. And uh, I'll come back to how exactly we define manifolds uh, momentarily. Uh, and for now, uh, of course, you, you, you can think of uh, some of the examples that Asha brought up. You can also just think of a, of a sphere. And here it's important that I do mean the sphere and not the ball. Okay, it's really about the shell. Uh, and, and, and that's a smooth manifold. But if you consider the ball uh, with everything that's inside, then, then I would not call that a smooth manifold. I would call that a, maybe a manifold with a boundary or something. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna handle boundaries uh, in here. Okay. Now, if your search space is a smooth manifold, then you can decide if you want to, you can decide to add some structure to it and make it the Riemannian manifold. And we'll go over what that means precisely uh, later on. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is because, well, very much echoing what happens in the Euclidean case, if you do, and if your cost function is sufficiently differentiable, we'll go over all of that, then this will afford you concepts of Riemannian gradients and Riemannian Hessians. And with those objects, you can then again design algorithms like gradient descent and Newton's method only in a Riemannian sense, okay, in a more general sense. I say more general because of course, or, you know, it will become clear, hopefully, um, Euclidean spaces are Riemannian manifolds, but there are many Riemannian manifolds that are not Euclidean spaces. Okay, now these ideas that somehow you can use these, um, you know, Riemannian geometry to optimize on nonlinear uh, nonlinear spaces. Um, this this is pretty much 50 years old now. Uh, in fact, there's the the, the seminal paper in the field uh, uh, is by uh, David Luenberger from July 1972. Um, and so, meaning next July, these ideas will be 50 years old, all right? So, you know, it's been around for a bit. However, at the onset uh, of uh, this uh, journey, uh, to call it that, um, it was very much thought of as a sort of a, a mathematical, uh, some, some mathematical fanciness. Um, and the reason was that it was not clear uh, at all that you could actually compute all of these geometric objects that would come up in the description of the algorithms that, you know, it was not clear that you might actually be able to compute them um, in, in concrete applications. Now, what happened later in the nineties is that people from uh, uh, control and numerical analysis, numerical linear algebra got interested. And uh, they started working out that on very many manifolds that do come up in applications, and I'll go over a few, the geometric objects that you need absolutely can be computed efficiently and robustly using techniques from uh, essentially numerical linear algebra. And the reason for that is that the manifolds that come up in applications oftentimes are sets of matrices. Okay, and, and then the, the, the objects, the geometric uh, tools that you need to compute, they, they end up uh, oftentimes, uh, it's the case that you can formulate them as, you know, matrix factorizations and, and you know, other things of that sort. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But that's, the, that's the, essentially the, the gist of it. Uh, we're going to redo everything from Euclidean space 
but do it now on Riemannian manifolds. And uh, in order for this to be a little bit more clear, what we're trying to do here, uh, I do want to take some time and tell you a bit more about what exactly is a manifold. Again, bearing in mind that you know, I'm sure many of you are very comfortable with the notion already, uh, uh, but maybe not everyone. And um, let's, uh, let's all get on the, on the same page here. All right, so a first take, simplistic, uh, on uh, you know, what is a manifold would simply uh, be to look at a few examples and non-examples and, and uh, see, what, you know, see what they're like. Uh, so I claim that uh, this here and that here, these two surfaces in R3, uh, they are manifold. In fact, they are smooth submanifolds of R3. Uh, R3 is the, the embedding space. And inside of that embedding space, there's a subset. Uh, on one hand, a sphere. On the other hand, a kind of a hyperbolic. And I claim that these things are smooth. And uh, intuitively, what that means is that if I look very close uh, you know, to any one point on those surfaces, uh, it's going to be difficult to distinguish this from just a, a linear space. They, they locally look flat. Another way of stating that is that locally, around any point of those surfaces, you can find a meaningful linear space, linear subspace that, that's a good approximation for it locally, okay? And in contrast, you cannot do this for the set over here, uh, because, for example, if you look at the kink region here, right? If you pick a point here at the at the angle, uh, it is not at all the case that you can somehow pick one linear subspace that is going to be a good local approximation for the surface, um, you know, around that point. And the reason for it is that you know, there's this angle that that you just cannot resolve with uh, with just one linear space. Okay, that is uh, take one, and, and I'll have three takes. Uh, the second take. Uh, is perhaps a bit more, more informative is to actually look at examples of actual sets that actually come up in, in applications in uh, data science, to call it that, um, and you know, which are manifolds, embedded submanifolds of a linear space. And in all of the examples that we're going to look at, there'll be three slides, six examples in total. Uh, in all of these examples, um, you'll notice that the embedding space will be um, a, a linear space of matrices. It's going to be matrices of size n by p or symmetric matrices of size n by n. In one example, it's just going to be vectors, a okay, special class of matrices. And inside of that in, uh, linear space of matrices is going to be a subset of interest, something that comes up in a, you know, in a natural way. And it's just going to have this property that it's locally linearizable. Although you know, it may not be as obvious as you know, when we just look at a picture and you can just immediately see, oh, sure, you know, I can linearize that. Yeah. Okay, but I'll, I'll just claim that the sets we're going to look at uh, have that property. And then we'll look at a proper definition later on. Okay, so the first two examples you'll see on each one of those slides, there are uh, applications listed at the bottom. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into them, uh, but if you're a quick reader, then, then you, can, you, know, you can have a look and what this is about, I'll share my slides uh, later and we can talk um, also. Okay, so, so the first uh, example is uh, the, called the Stiefel manifold. Okay, so at the top here. So here the embedding space is uh, the set of matrices of size N by P. And so they, they are tall and narrow matrices. Okay, so P is smaller than N, okay? And the Stiefel manifold is a subset of such matrices that is defined by um, these defining equations, x transpose x is the identity. And what this is encoding is simply that the p columns of x are orthonormal uh, in Rn. There are vectors of norm one in Rn and they're all orthogonal uh, one to each other. Uh, so the Stiefel manifold is a, is a set of such matrices. And I claim that this is a, this is a manifold. This is a smooth embedded submanifold of Rn by p. Uh, and notice uh, something interesting about this. If you set p equal to one, then this is really just a sphere in Rn, okay? Which is then also a manifold as, as we would imagine. And if you set p equal to n, then this is the orthogonal group, okay? It's just the set of orthogonal matrices of size n by n, right? which has two disconnected components. Um, one of them is uh, the orthogonal matrices with determinant plus one. And the other one is the orthogonal matrices with determinant negative one. If you just keep the ones with determinant plus one, then that's the rotation group, uh, also called the SON. 
And in particular, uh, you know, just to, to write it this way, because this is what typically happens in applications. If you consider the rotation group in R3, so the set of three by three orthogonal matrices with determinant plus one, this um, is a smooth manifold again. And each matrix in that set corresponds exactly and uniquely to one rotation in R3 or to one orientation in R3. And you can probably imagine how uh, you know, this comes up in applications in computer vision and imaging uh, and you know, in, in other situations. Okay, so if you need to optimize over those sets, you're optimizing on a manifold. Another couple of examples. Uh, the Grassman manifold is, it sounds a bit more abstract. Um, it's not really. Is the set of, it is a set of subspaces, linear subspaces of Rn that have a certain given dimension D. So N and D are fixed here. I start with Rn and let's say D is two. And so I consider all the planes that pass through the origin uh, in Rn. And the set of all such planes is, well, it's a set. And formally, we can say that this is a, a manifold. It's a smooth set. Um, now, you can actually formulate this uh, in a way that is going to be embedded in something, all right, so that you can really picture it as being a, a subset of matrices. And you can do it the following way. You say, OK, if I have a subset of dimension D in Rn, then there exists a unique symmetric matrix of size n by n, which is an orthogonal projector to that subspace, right? To every subspace, there is a corresponding and unique orthogonal projector to that subspace. So really, the Grassmann manifold, which is a set of subspaces, is the same thing as uh, a set of um, particular symmetric matrices, which happen to be uh, orthogonal projectors. So the set of such matrices is an embedded submanifold in uh, the symmetric matrices of size n by n. Okay, and that's the Grassmann manifold. If you've, um, if you've seen different geometries or seemingly different geometries for the Grassmann manifold before, maybe as a quotient of the Schieffel manifold or as a quotient of the orthogonal group, uh, they're actually pretty much all equivalent. Okay, and you, you can make this very formal. Okay. Um, fourth example, if you are optimizing over matrices of size m by n, but you're only interested in the matrices whose rank is equal to R, and it's important I'm saying equal to R, not bounded by R, then that set, again, is a smooth embedded submanifold of uh, the set of matrices. Okay, there are some intricacies to this one. It's a bit more complicated to handle than others, uh, but certainly, um, you know, uh, if you have encountered optimization problems on, on, with rank constraints, um, then, which I'm sure many of you have, then, then uh, this, this could be a tool, um, you know, that can be useful in that in that situation. All right, third uh, couple of examples, uh, third and last couple of examples, uh, and this one uh, I imagine uh, will feature much more uh, in, in Suvrit's presentation. And uh, the first one already uh, featured in Asha's presentation is the set of positive definite matrices, which is simply you know symmetric matrices size n by n. That that's a linear space, but then among those you decide only to care about the ones that are positive definite. Here, I, I do insist on it being strictly positive definite, not just positive semi-definite, because I, I don't wanna have to deal with the boundary. It's just not something we're going to do here. Uh, but if you just consider the, the open set of positive definite matrices, uh, that's a manifold. In a way, it's a manifold for a stupid reason, just because it's an open set in a linear space and well, open sets can be linearized, uh, but it's not very interesting, not, not very instructive. However, if you turn it into a Riemannian manifold in an interesting way, then things, uh, um, well, more interesting things happen. And, and you know, we heard some about, some about it uh, already. We'll hear much more about it, I, I uh, presume. Um, and then the hyperbolic space is kind of the same story. Um, you can define hyperboloids in Rn plus one you know, with this equation. Um, if you do that, you just get some nice, smooth sets in, uh, in Rn plus one, which, OK, fine, it's a manifold. Uh, but things really get interesting when you endow this with, an, you know, with a special Riemannian metric, which I'm not going to do here. I just want to highlight that for those two sets in particular, those two manifolds in particular, um, you know, uh, uh, applications would involve you endowing them with a special metric that makes them carton Hadamard manifolds. And that's where geodesic convexity really shines. Um, and we'll hear more about that later. Okay. All right. So that's... Uh, 
the, the intro, uh, longish intro. And what I'd like to do starting now, and um, you know, we, we can stop for questions before that, uh, if there are any. What I'd like to do now is actually take a lot of time to go over just the, the basic technical tools from differential geometry, starting really uh, at the basics, differential geometry and Riemannian geometry that we need for optimization. And in order for this to fit in a short, uh, you know, in a one hour talk, uh, I'm going to uh, limit the discussion to embedded submanifolds of linear spaces, even though manifolds are more general than that. Okay, but this will make it easier to give more concrete definitions for everything. Uh, so that's one uh, aspect. The other aspect is that you'll see, I, I will really focus everything on just the definitions and the tools that we need for optimization. Whereas uh, if you have uh, taken a differential geometry course before, uh, I'm sure the focus was on very different objects, uh, at least uh, you know, at some point in the course, uh, there's a, a shift in, in um, interests between applied mathematicians and uh, pure mathematicians to, to stay that way. So before I uh, jump into that, uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to, uh, to discuss. All right, so if not, then let's uh, just get started uh, with um, a string of uh, definitions, but, but uh, I'll try to provide a uh, context and, and the motivation for all of them and, and tell you why we need them and, and what uh, they're going to do for us, okay? All right, so what is a manifold take three? Uh, now with passion, with uh, epsilons and deltas, um, we're going to say that a subset M of a linear space E, so think RD, is a smooth embedded submanifold of dimension N. So M will have dimension N, uh, E has dimension D. If uh, the following is possible, and you can follow along on the, the cartoon down here. So M is the circle and it is a subset of R2. And I'm going to say that this set here is, an, is smooth if I can do the following. For every point X in the set, I can find a neighborhood of X in uh, RD, okay, in E. And a smooth map C, Psi, which maps that neighborhood U to some open set in RD, call it V. All right, so Psi of U is going to be some open set in RD. The dimension here has to match the one of E, all right? In such a way that, well, of course, X will be mapped to some point in there, but also I want the little bit of M that is included in U. I want that to be mapped to, well, of course, a little bit of V, but that little bit of V has to be straight, it has to be uh, you know, a linear patch, if you will, uh, in RD. Now I want to be able to do that in such a way that C is smooth. And you know, in the usual sense for what it means to be smooth in, in RD, just C infinity, uh, infinitely differentiable. Um, it has to be smooth, it has to be invertible, and the inverse of C has to be smooth as well. And so we say that C is a diffeomorphism. Okay, now if you can do that, if locally around each point, you can deform the set in such a way that it locally becomes just flat, uh, and you can do this everywhere, um, maybe just not all at once, then we say that the set is a smooth manifold, or it's smoothly embedded in a linear space. Okay, and, and it's an interesting, but not entirely trivial exercise to take this definition and to show that this set here, the cross, does not satisfy the definition. Right, so if you have uh, such a kind of a, a you know, non-smooth point, like a crossing point, uh, it, it's not possible to find such a, such a diffeomorphism. Okay, so showing that the definition rightfully uh, excludes uh, such, uh, such sets. All right, so that's what's a what a manifold is. I'm not going to need the definition going forward, but it's maybe good to, to see it, uh, at least formally, at least once. All right, and E is the embedding space. Something that's going to be more useful um, going forward is the following quick observations. One, you know, uh, every set I've mentioned before is a manifold. So sets of orthonormal matrices, you can find such diffeomorphisms. Fixed rank matrices as well. Uh, positive definite matrices, well, uh, this is true just because it's an open set. And if you think about it, the definition from before, uh, you know, if your set M is just open in RD, 
then for obvious reasons, you can find a diffeomorphism that will map it to an open set. Okay. So um, all of these guys are manifolds. Linear subspaces are manifolds. Open subsets of manifolds are manifolds. Here, I mean to use a subspace topology. Okay. Open subsets of manifolds are manifolds. That's useful to know. And also useful to know products of manifolds, Cartesian products of manifolds are also manifolds. All right. Now, why do we care about manifolds? With, uh, mostly, we care about them because they are linearizable. What does it mean to linearize a manifold? It means that you, know, you can approximate it with a tangent, tangent space at each point. What's a tangent space? It's a set of tangent vectors. So what's a tangent vector? All right. So we can look at the cartoon here at the bottom left. If you have your manifold M, think of it as a subset of, uh, I don't know, R3, OK? And there is a point X on the manifold M. What do I call a tangent vector? Well, I would like for tangent vectors to capture the idea that if V is tangent at X, then it means that it's possible to move away from X along the direction V you know, at first and at first order, uh, but in such a way that I stay on the manifold M. So stated a bit more formally, um, I'm going to call V a tangent vector if it's possible to find a smooth curve C of T on the manifold. What does it mean that the curve is smooth? Well, if you're a curve on the manifold, since the manifold is in a linear space, you're also a curve in the linear space. So I'm just saying, you know, you have to be a smooth curve in the linear space, and you have to happen to stay on the manifold. All right. So V is a tangent vector at X. If you can find a smooth curve C of T on the manifold that passes through X with velocity V. Okay, and this is what we see here. All right, so C prime of zero is a tangent vector um, at X if C of zero is equal to X and, and C is smooth. Okay, so the other way around, um, you know, for, for every such curve, you get a tangent vector, but for every tangent vector, there's going to be at least one such curve, in fact, infinitely many. Uh, then what do we call the tangent space? Well, it's just going to be the set of all tangent vectors. And if you think about the sphere here, it's not difficult to convince yourself, uh, if you're not already, that the tangent space to the sphere at x is going to be this you know, linear subspace of dimension 2 that really just uh, intuitively is the tangent space to the sphere there. Um, it's just the, the subspace that's orthogonal to, to point x, Okay, orthogonal with respect to the usual inner product in, in, uh, in Rn. All right. Now, the, the big thing about uh, smooth manifolds is that the tangent space is defined in this way, r uh, linear subspaces of E, and they will have the same dimension, uh, and that dimension is what we call the dimension of M. Okay, but if you pick just some, you know, any fancy set, like for example the cross from earlier, and you think about, you know, what is a tangent vector according to this definition for a cross, you will get, a, and then you figure out what's the tangent space, you'll get a set which is not uh, a linear space. Okay, so this is somewhat special about manifolds. OK. In the particular case where your manifold is defined through uh, you know, some nonlinear, usually nonlinear equality constraints, like h of x equals 0, and under some conditions I'm not going to spell out, uh, the tangent space happens to just be the kernel of the differential of the defining equation. Uh, and you can check that for the sphere. This is, you, know, you get the right thing. OK. So this is oftentimes uh, the more convenient way of figuring out the, the, the tangent space of a of a manifold that you're working with. Although most of the time you're working with a manifold that you know, has already come up and uh, you just look up its, uh, its tangent space in the book. All right, okay. Now, um, tangent spaces are going to come back uh, often. Uh, the other thing that's going to come back often in the presentation is the notion of smooth maps on and to manifolds. Um, so how is that defined? It's not going to be too shocking. Um, if M and M prime, are two smooth manifolds in two linear spaces, E and E prime, um, then something that you know, uh, we might want is that if you have a smooth function that's defined in the embedding space, okay, say for example, you have a smooth function defined on all of E, a real function defined on all of E, and formally, and call that F bar, 
And formally you say, well, I'm only interested in the value of F, of F bar, sorry. I'm only interested in the value of F bar on the manifold. So I restrict F bar to the manifold and formally I get a new function F that is only defined on M. Then it seems reasonable that, that we would want that if F bar was smooth in the usual sense, that then its restriction F would also be deemed smooth. And in fact, we're just going to pick the definition in such a way that this is essentially, you know, all smooth functions are of that form. So we're going to say that a function on a manifold is smooth if it's possibly if it's possible to smoothly extend it, to find some F bar smooth on a neighborhood of the manifold, such that F and F bar coincide on the manifold. Okay. All right. Now, the big thing about that definition, uh, as you might expect, as you might hope, is that um, if you have two smooth maps on manifolds and you, you can uh, compose them, the domains are just right, then the composition is still smooth. Nicola, so yep. question. So here, by smoothness, you still mean uh, infinitely differentiable. I do, yes. Uh, how about like the optimization type smoothness, like or lichiousness properties? Yes. So, so I, I will not use the word smooth in that sense. Uh, so in the sense of a Lipschitz continuous gradient. Mm -hmm. However, that notion uh, will pop up uh, much later in the presentation when I talk about Riemannian gradient descent. Um, it will be a bit in disguise though, but, but we can talk about, uh, about it more at that, at that time. Yep. Thanks. Yep. And so, so maybe this is also a, a, good, um, um, a good moment to, to also say, I'm, I'm just doing everything in C infinity because it's convenient, especially in a, in a presentation for everything to just be easy. Um, but of course, you know, much, much of what I'll discuss can be done with the uh, lesser notions of smoothness, uh, CK for, you know, other values of K. All right. Okay, so what do we do with uh, smooth maps? Well, we differentiate them. And what does it mean to differentiate a map uh, from a manifold to a manifold? Okay, so say you have a map F from M to M prime, and I'd like to come up with a good notion of what the differential of F at some point X on a manifold might be. And then we think, well, okay, um, what is the differential supposed to tell me? It's supposed to tell me what happens to F of X if I push X a little bit in some direction. If I, if I have a point X on a manifold like here, on the manifold M and I push it through F, I get a point F of X on M prime. Now, if I push X a little bit in the direction V along a tangent direction V, then something's going to happen to F of X is also going to end up being pushed in some direction. And I'd like to know in what direction and that's what I ideally would call the differential of F of X uh, along V. So this is exactly how we're going to define things. We'll say, okay, well, if V is a tangent vector at X, then by definition of tangent vectors, there exists a smooth curve C of T that passes through X with velocity V. The curve C of T lies entirely on M. Therefore, I can compose it with F and I'll get a function F of C of T, which is now going to be on M prime. Since the curve is smooth and the map F is smooth, and composition preserve, preserves smoothness and F of C of T is a smooth curve on M prime. And it passes through F of X, right? Just take T equals zero um, if, if C of zero is equal to X. So that is a smooth curve on M prime, which passes through F of X. It does so with a certain velocity. And that velocity is just what we're going to call, we're going to define that that is the differential of F at X along V, right? That's just a definition. Now, when you come to the ah, exactly right. So when you when you come to that definition in this way, then then you know uh, <laughs> the, the the right question should be uh, indeed. Well, it, it, does this somehow depend on the curve? Because if it does, then this is not a good definition, right? The, the left hand side here does not uh, involve any particular curve, uh, but the right hand side does. Uh, so the claim here, and this is actually an easy exercise. I'm just not going into any of the details. But the claim is that this is indeed well-defined, does not depend on the curve. And not only that, but this operator dfx is linear, which is not immediately obvious from the definition, all right? But it is linear as you would presumably want the differential to be. And also you have a chain rule, 
Uh, so if you have a composition of smooth maps, it's smooth, and the differential of the composition will obey a chain rule. So which is essentially telling you that you know, calculus on manifolds um, it will not be a, a, um, a brain straining exercise, just all the things that we're used to do, uh, you know, just basically still going to work. Um, now, one easy way to prove that claim is actually to observe uh, this other um, useful rule for uh, calculations, which is, well, if F is smooth, then by definition, it has a smooth extension F bar. It can be more than one smooth extension. There's at least one smooth extension. I mean, there's always infinitely many. Just pick a smooth extension F bar. Now, this is just a smooth map defined in an open set in a linear space. So you can differentiate it in the usual way you know, with the limit and blah, blah, blah. Now, you'll get a linear map as we're used to, except it's defined on more than the tangent space. And the claim here, and this is easy to check, is that if you restrict that differential to the tangent space, you will get something that does not depend on the choice of smooth extension. And uh, it's actually going to be equal to uh, that operator right here. Okay, And oftentimes, when you have an, uh, a function on a manifold, what you actually have is smooth extension. You just declare formally, I'm only interested in what happens on a manifold. Uh, but because you have the smooth extension, you can just differentiate that and, and you get all the expressions that you need. All right. So that's the differential of a smooth map. And now I'm going to introduce um, one more object before we move on to, to Riemannian geometry. And, and so far, you know, there's no Riemannian whatever uh, in the mix. Uh, the, the additional tool that I need is a means to move around the manifold. Uh, you know, I, I want to, in optimization, I'm going to generate sequences of points, x0, x1, x2, x3. I'm going to hope that those sequences will converge to interesting points. Uh, but for this, I need to be able to jump from one point in the manifold to another. And retractions will be you know, our friend in that process. Um, so you can already imagine how we're actually going to do this in practice by looking at this cartoon on the bottom right. Um, one fairly intuitive way to proceed is to say, if I have a point x on a manifold, in this case on a sphere, and I have a tangent vector v there, if I just do x plus v, well, Usually that's not going to be on a manifold anymore unless it's linear. Um, however, maybe I can project x plus v back to the manifold with something called metric projection. Just find the closest point on the manifold to x plus v. Right, that's one possible choice. I do want to insist here. It's not that all retractions are of that form, but certainly if you're asked to move around the manifold and, and you, know, you don't know anything about any of that, uh, presumably you know, everyone would come up with it this way. It's kind of intuitive to do this. Um, so you can do this on many manifolds, by the way. So of course, if your manifold is linear, then just do x plus v, and then you're done. If you are in the sphere, you can do x plus v and divide by the norm. This will bring you back. Uh, if you are on the set of matrices with fixed rank, then x and v are two matrices. You can add them up and then do a truncated SVD to project back to the you know, rank R matrices with some caveats here. But, but essentially, this is what um, uh, you can do this. Okay, so all of these are examples of metric projections, and I'm going to call them retractions right after I define what the retraction is. Okay, now um, what this object, what this map R is going to do is it's going to take as input a point X and a tangent vector V at X, and it's going to transform that into a usually new point on a manifold. So the domain of R, is going to be this thing here, which is called the tangent bundle. It's a set, and every element in the set is a pair xv, where x is a point in the manifold, and v is a tangent vector there. And that's it. The tangent bundle is just and nothing but uh, the set of pairs of that form. A point, the tangent vector there, this is a tangent bundle. Now, a retraction is going to be a map. However, uh, it's going to be a special map. Um, so I just left a blank here. We'll come back to this. A retraction is a map, R, which takes as input a pair xv and produces as output a point m on a manifold. So xv to rxv. And it should have the following property, that you can create curves with a retraction. Why? Well, because the output of the retraction is a point on the manifold. So if you retract a family of things, 
you'll get a family of points in the manifold. Okay, so you can create curves with a retraction. And what we require is that if you retract nothing, okay, if uh, the you, ret you retract zero times v, uh, then you should not move. So the, if you start retracting at x, you should create a curve that passes through x. And the second thing is that the initial velocity, the initial direction in which you're moving should match the direction that you were given. So in other words, a retraction is going to be some kind of a, you know, a map of this type that will generate curves that pass through x with a given velocity. You can imagine how this will be useful for reminding gradient descent, for example, where I'll be at a point, I'll have a gradient that I still need to define as going to be some kind of a tangent vector, and I'll want to move away from x along the negative gradient direction. Okay, we'll use a retraction for that. Okay. Now, ideally, I would want for this choice, uh, this retraction choice to be smooth uh, and to make sense of that, I need R to be a map from a manifold to a manifold because you know, that's the best definition we have for now is uh, the definition for a map to be smooth is when it goes from one manifold to another. Um, and uh, you know, the, the fact here that's helpful is that the tangent bundle is a smooth manifold. If you have a manifold, its tangent bundle is a manifold. And so it makes sense to say, I want the retraction to be smooth. Right? Hopefully this makes, uh, this makes sense. All right, so that's retractions. And that's all we had to do for just basic differential geometry, just the notion of things that are smooth and cal calculus with them. Uh, if we wanna um, go further and develop algorithms for optimization on manifolds, then it's convenient. I'm not saying it's necessary, but certainly convenient uh, to add more structure and to define the notion of Riemannian manifolds. Okay, now, um, this is actually just going to take one slide to define. Uh, there's not much to it, uh, but it's, it's, it's good to see this at least once. When we went from Rn, from just bare Rn to Euclidean spaces, we did so by uh, defining an inner product on Rn, okay? Now, uh, inner products are defined in linear spaces. Manifolds are not linear, but manifolds are linearizable at, at each point. Um, all right. So uh, the idea here is going to be the following. So, okay, at each point x on the manifold, um, there's a tangent space, Txm. Txm is a linear space. So formally, I can define an inner product. I'm going to index with x because now there's going to be many. I can define an inner product on Txm, just a, a you know bilinear uh, symmetric positive definite map uh, form. Um, on, on TXM, okay? It's just very formally. It's a linear space, defining our product there, do this for each point X. Now, we'll say that if the inner product vary smoothly with X, and the blank here is that because I need to explain what that means. If the inner products vary smoothly with X, then uh, we say that they form a Riemannian metric. Again, it's always the same idea that we want things to be smooth. Um, all right, so a Riemannian metric is a, is a smoothly varying choice of inner product on the tangent spaces. And a Riemannian manifold is just a smooth manifold with a Riemannian metric. Okay, that's it. Now, what does it mean to, uh, that the inner products vary smoothly with X? Uh, well, I need one more concept to make this. Uh, there are many ways to answer that question, but let me just go with the one that fits in this amount of space. Um, and for this, I need a new, uh, you know, just a new object, but it's not going to be too shocking and we'll need it again later anyway. What is a vector field in Rn? It's just, it's a map that to each point of Rn associates a vector in Rn. Okay. What's a vector field on a manifold? It's a map, let's call it V, which to each point X of the manifold associates a tangent vector at X. So uh, the, you know, the output of the vector field formally is going to be a pair xv in the tangent bundle, uh, where v is going to be tangent at x, all right? And because v is a map from a manifold to another manifold, this tangent bundle, it makes sense to say that the vector field is or is not smooth, just using everything we've defined so far. Good. So then how are we going to define the fact that inner products vary smoothly? Well, here's one way. Kind of neat. Um, we'll define this way. We say, okay, pick 
two smooth vector fields, arbitrary, just two smooth vector fields in a manifold, U and V. Now at each point X, I now have two tangent vectors, right? I have U of X and V of X or two tangent vectors at X. Okay. What can I do with two tangent vectors? I can take their inner product because on each tangent space, I have an inner product. So I can take their inner product. I'll get a real number. So from the two um, smooth vector fields, I created a scalar field, just a real function on the manifold. And that function may or may not be smooth. So we're just going to say um, that if every time I pick two smooth vector fields and I transform it in this way, I get a smooth scalar field, then we will say, OK, well, this seems to be a, a nice, uh, smoothly varying choice of inner products. Uh, you get to be called the Riemannian metric. That's it. All right, so that's a Riemannian manifold. I want to highlight something here, uh, just for the, you know, just the, this question of where structure comes from, um, is that a manifold, for example, a Stiefel manifold, a set of positive definite matrices, can always be endowed with infinitely many different Riemannian structures. But the optimization problem that you start with, it's not defined, you know, it does not come with a Riemannian structure. It's not part of the problem definition. You just had a set and a cost function and that's it. So we choose a metric, but the metric we choose, the Riemannian metric we choose is something that we do for algorithmic purposes. And this, you know, it came up in Asha's presentation already um, quite a few times, and it's going to come back in, in Suvrit's presentation as well. Um, so the choice of metric is really something new for algorithms. And it's in the same vein as when we precondition in numerical linear algebra, we just choose a convenient and, and, and a fruitful representation of things uh, so that computations will, will uh, you know, work out uh, more nicely. Now, in the same way that in numerical linear algebra, we know that there are many problems where if we precondition, life will be better, but we don't because it's difficult to come up with a smart preconditioner. It's kind of the same business in Riemannian optimization. Sure, it would be nice if you can come up with a nice Riemannian structure specifically tailored to your problem, but oftentimes you just use a Riemannian structure that's convenient. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and uh, you know, th then you work things out uh, separately. Okay, but, but it's good to remember that you could in principle uh, be a lot, a lot smarter about all of this. Okay. All right, so what is a, um, a convenient choice of a Riemannian metric on a manifold embedded in a Euclidean space? Uh, well, there's this notion of Riemannian submanifolds, which, uh, which uh, goes as follows. Uh, it says, okay, if I have a manifold M embedded in a Euclidean space E, Rn, for example, then E is equipped with A metric, a Euclidean metric, one inner product, which is defined everywhere, okay, in all of Rn, for example. Now, the tangent spaces of the manifold are linear subspaces of the embedding space. And therefore, formally, I can take the Euclidean inner product and just restrict it to each individual tangent space. Every time I do that, I get an inner product just defined on that particular tangent space. Okay, and then you know you can you get to write something like this because you, if u and v are tangent to, to m at x, then they're also vectors in the embedding space, just because it's a subspace. All right. Now um, it's not too surprising, and it's very easy to show to confirm formally uh, that this choice of inner products is a Riemannian metric. And if this is the Riemannian metric that you choose, which oftentimes people do because it's convenient, we'll see again, uh, then the manifold you get, the Riemannian manifold you get, uh, is something we call the Re a Riemannian submanifold of E. Uh, and it's important to remember that a Riemannian submanifold is not just a submanifold that happens to be Riemannian, it's specifically this Riemannian structure. Okay. All right. Good. So we have manifolds, we have smooth functions of manifolds, we know how to differentiate them. Uh, we have retractions, we can move around. Um, we have um, now Riemannian metrics. And the whole reason we build Riemannian metrics, at least in the context of optimization, is because we want to get to gradients and Hessians. And those we want to get to algorithms. OK, so what's the gradient? What's the Riemannian gradient of a function? Well, remember the definition of gradient of a Euclidean function, okay, which you have here at the bottom right, 
And you see it's defined with respect to the Euclidean inner product uh, in terms of the, the directional derivatives of the function, the differential of, of f. So on manifold is going to be the same thing. Say, so, okay, I have a smooth function f on a manifold, then its gradient, its Riemannian gradient is going to be a vector field. We'll write it grad f, which is defined in the following way. So grad f of x is here. This is a tangent vector at x, okay, since grad f is a vector field. Grad f x is a tangent vector at x. And it is uniquely defined by the property that if I take its inner product with any vector v in the tangent space at x, I'll get a real number. And that real number is equal to the directional derivative of f at x along v. So it's just uh, the grad f x is the, the Reese representative of the differential of f, if you will. Okay, now I claim uh, that this is a well-defined vector field that's very easy to check. I also claim that this is a well-defined smooth vector field, which is, well, um, it takes more work to, to actually check that, but it's true. Because if you have a smooth function, it's gradient is a smooth vector field. Okay. In practice, you often need to compute this if you're actually going to run an algorithm. Um, in the special case, it's a special case, but it's a frequent special case, let me highlight it where M is a Riemannian submanifold of a Euclidean space. Okay, so the thing I just defined, when you just take the Euclidean inner product, you're restricted to all the tangent spaces, you get a special metric. In that particular case, um, you can compute the Riemannian gradient as follows. So, okay, if F is smooth, then it has a smooth extension, F bar. It has many, just pick one. Now, F bar is a nice smooth function defined in an open set of Rn, for example. Okay. I can compute this gradient, the usual Euclidean gradient. The definition is here. We all have our tricks to compute gradients. You get something, a vector, usually not a tangent vector. There's no reason for it to be a tangent vector. Okay, F bar does not know anything about the manifold really. But if you then orthogonally project the thing you got, so proj x is orthogonal projector to the tangent space at x, well then of course you get a tangent vector. And the thing you get actually is the Riemannian gradient. Okay, but it's a special case. However, it's an important special case. The other thing I want to highlight is, again, usually in applications, it's not that you have to come up with a smooth extension. Usually you have F bar, and then you just formally say, I'm interested in the restriction, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but usually you have F bar, so you differentiate in the usual way. You project, you have the remaining grid, you're done. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, that's gradients. What about the Hessians? Well, um, I'm not going to give you a full story here because it's actually, it takes a lot more work to define Riemannian Hessians, but let me highlight why, or, or you know, at least where does it block at first? Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll show you a, a, a sort of a, a way around it, but, but okay, we just don't have the time to go into details here. What should the Riemannian Hessian of a function f be? Well, um, the, Riemann, the, the Hessian, uh, you know, in the Euclidean case anyway, the Hessian measures, uh, it, it's, a kind, it's the differential of the gradient, really. It tells you how the gradient varies if you push x along some direction. So we want the Riemannian Hessian to be kind of the same thing. We want the Riemannian Hessian of f at x to be a linear map, ideally a symmetric linear map, because that's what we have in Rn, from the tangent space to the tangent space. Okay, it, ha it has to be defined on the tangent space because I can only push things along tangent directions. And if I want it to be symmetric, well, the codomain better be the same as the domain. So it has to be from the tangent space to the tangent space, all right? And I wanted to describe gradient change. So another way to say, say this is ideally, I would like for the Hessian of FX along V to be something kind of like, but note the question mark, to be something kind of like the differential of the gradient of F at X along V, okay? This actually makes sense. You can write this, that this is well-defined, why? because a gradient is a vector field and a vector field is just a map from a manifold from a ma to a manifold. And we can differentiate maps from manifolds to manifolds and it's smooth. So you can write this down, it makes sense. Unfortunately, it's not a good definition of a Hessian. Why? Because in general, the thing you get from that you know, thing uh, is just, it's not a tangent vector. So you'll get a linear map from the tangent space, yes, but the codomain will not be the tangent space. So there's no chance that it's going to be a symmetric linear map, meaning you won't have a notion of uh, you know, a Hessian that is positive definite or negative definite, blah, 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 which are all very useful in optimization. Okay, so this is a no-go. 
Um, the, the proper way of going around this issue, uh, like I said, would take a while, but you can do this. What you need is actually a new notion of derivative for vector fields. And different, in differential geometry, it's called an affine connection. On each manifold, there are many affine connections. It's just ways of differentiating vector fields. Among all of them, if you're on a Riemannian manifold, there is a unique affine connection, which has very special properties um, you know, that are well attuned with the Riemannian metric. And if you pick that connection, it's called the Riemannian connection. And if you apply that to differentiate the, the gradient, it's called the covariant uh, derivative, then you get what's called the Riemannian Hessian. Okay, so these are all things you can define properly. For computation, let me just you know, flash the formula and, and then uh, go forward. In the particular case of a Riemannian submanifold of a Euclidean space, okay, same as before, where you had uh, you know, the gradient, which is an orthogonal projection. Uh, well, in that particular case, what you need to do is you compute this and say, oh, it's not tangent, but it's just, it's just projected to the tangent space. And that's actually you know, the right thing to do, except there's a formal way of, of explaining why that is. Uh, if you work this out, you'll see that there are some terms that capture the, the, the extrinsic curvature of the manifold and there's some correction terms and what. Okay, but let's move on. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this. Like I said, I'll share my slides. This is an example, very simple optimization problem on a sphere where everything's computed, where you have you know, explicit expressions that you could easily put in a computer. I just, you know, if you want to play with this and, and see, you know, check that you, everything clicks, then you, you can look at this, uh, at this example. Okay. All right. Okay. So finally, there's going to be some optimization in this intro to op optimization on smooth manifolds. Uh, we're just going to look at um, you know, a couple algorithms. Uh, I do see that the time is short, so I'll go for the, uh, you know, I'll go for the essentials. Um, the idea for building algorithms is going to be the, the, the following. Um, it's always going to be hopping around using a retraction. So you'll have some point xk. At xk, you'll pick a tangent vector sk. You retract it, it gives you a new point xk plus one, and then you go again. Okay, so what's an algorithm on a manifold? It's a way of to pick tangent uh, vectors, sk. And uh, well, bearing in mind that the retraction is also something that you choose you know, as the user or the algorithm designer, you know, whoever you may be. Okay, so what's an example of an algorithm? Well, Riemannian gradient descent just says, okay, let's pick the tangent vector to be the negative gradient with some step size tk, which you choose with the line search, business as usual. What is Newton's method? Well, um, you know, if you remember Newton's equation from the Euclidean case, it's just the same thing. And for the same reason, really, you just say, okay, um, the Hessian is a linear map from the tangent space to the tangent space. The negative gradient is the tangent vector in that, uh, in that tangent space. Let's solve this linear system of equations in the tangent space. You can do this using matrix free uh, solvers, for example, conjugate gradients. Um, the, you know, if the Hessian is positive definite, SK is uniquely defined, retract that, uh, that's Newton's method on the manifold. How do you analyze those algorithms? How do you make sure they behave well? Well, the, the essential is just to bring things back, you know, to, to massage things until um, you can just work with the analysis, you know, from Euclidean space. Uh, and the way to do that is just, uh, I mean, or rather a tool of choice to do so is to observe that really what you need is to understand how is the value of f at xk plus one going to behave? So if I want to know what f at xk plus one is, I need to know what is f of the retraction at xk of sk. So I need to understand how does the composition of f with the retraction at the point behave? I need to understand what this guy looks like. But f composed with the retraction at x, that's just a function in a linear space. Okay, because the retraction at x, it, it, it eats up a tangent vector. So this is really a real function defined on a linear space, in fact, on a Euclidean space. And this thing has a, Euclid, uh, has a Taylor expansion. And up to some technical points that I'm uh, you know, uh, omitting here, uh, the Taylor expansion looks exactly like what you might expect, except it's using our Riemannian concept. We have the Riemannian gradient, the Riemannian inner product, the Riemannian Hessian. And now that you have a Taylor expansion, 
you know, if you remember uh, from just this morning, how we analyze gradient descent, how we analyze Newton's method, you can imagine how having this tool at your disposal will just uh, allow you to, to uh, make things go through. Okay. Um, mm -mm, okay, I'll, I'll take a, a couple more minutes for, uh, for this slide. If you were you know, wondering about um, proving global convergence rates, uh, and again, echoing with some of the stuff that came up uh, earlier this morning, um, we can look at a very simple version of reminding gradient descent. And this is where uh, you know, we're going to connect with the question about the L smoothness, you know, the, the notion that a function has, uh, you know, in Euclidean space, we often study optimization problems where we assume that the gradient of the function is ellipsis continuous. Now, in Euclidean space, the gradient of a function is ellipsis continuous if and only if it satisfies inequalities of this form or the retraction would just be x plus s. So here, in order, you know, I'm just going to assume that we have inequalities of this form, but involving the retraction. And this actually is, is intimately connected with the notion of having a Riemannian Lipschitz continuous gradient. It's just that to define this properly, I would need parallel transports and uh, exponential maps, and, and we're just not going to go there today. Um, but, but these inequalities here, you can think of them as really assuming L smoothness, but in a differential geometric way. So I'm going to assume this with some constant L. I'm going to assume that the function is globally lower bounded. Okay, and the whole manifold kind of makes sense for optimization. We're going to look at this very simple algorithm where you just uh, retract the negative gradient with constant one over L. You could replace this with line search. It just makes the proof a little bit longer, but it's the same. Then the complexity result you get is exactly the same as in the Euclidean case. Namely that if you iterate this method for capital K iterations, you encounter capital K points. Each one of them has a gradient. Each one of those gradients has a norm. One of them is smaller than everybody else. How small is it? Well, it's not bigger than this. And you know, you see it decays like one over root K uh, and, and the constants here are exactly the same as you had in Euclidean case in particular. There's no dependence on dimension of the manifold and there's no dependence on curvature of the manifold, which is a whole other story. The proof of this is this is it. That's the whole proof. And there's nothing geometric about it. It's just pure algebra uh, or you know, just uh, manipulations of, of you know, inequalities. It's the same proof as in the Euclidean case. There's nothing about it. Everything geometric is hidden in that assumption. Okay. I'm out of time, so let me just uh, point out that if you're interested in, in using these things, uh, on the software side, uh, I would recommend, uh, just to make it short, that you go to manup.org. Uh, this is a toolbox I've been working on in MATLAB. Uh, there's Python and Julia versions developed by other people, but synchronized. Um, and also at this address, you can find pointers to other toolboxes by other people, and they're all very good. And so, you know, th this is uh, just a, considered a portal for resources about this topic. Uh, there's many active research directions. One I kind of like, one I very much like, is that it seems that uh, geometry and symmetry uh, come up quite a bit in uh, the phenomenon of benign non-convexity, which is gonna skip those slides, enjoy the pictures, pockets of non-convexity, where's the tractability frontier. Um, and there's a very nice uh, survey by um, uh, Jean, Ku, and Wright. This is John Wright from uh, Colombia, where they talk about the pervasiveness of geometry and symmetry and benign non-convexity. And if you're interested to read more about this topic, uh, there's uh, the de facto reference book in the, in the field by Absil Mahoney and Sepulch from uh, 2008. You can get it for free at this address. And uh, I am also recently been working on a book, which you can also get for free uh, at this address. And uh, I thank you for your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, if you have. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the great talk. Uh, are there any quick questions that people want to ask? Uh, yeah, I, I guess you mentioned how the optimization problem itself, you know, doesn't come along with an intrinsic Riemannian structure, and this is something that you impose separately. Uh, could you maybe give a remark on uh, how how you select what's a how you know what's an appropriate structure to select for a given problem? Or 
Yeah, it, it's a um, it's a tough question, right? To to know for for each, it's like preconditioning. You you know, from numerical linear algebra, how are you going to select a good preconditioner? To to some extent, it, it's a, it's an art. Uh, but there are cer certain metrics that you can uh, that you can look at to decide. Okay, uh, is this better than that? And um, uh, for example, one thing you can look at is um, so the, the local convergence rates of methods like uh, gradient descent and, and others ultimately is going to be uh, dictated by the condition number of the Hessian at your limit point. So the, the condition number of the Riemannian Hessian at your limit point. Now, that is uh, directly a function of your choice of Riemannian metric, right? Because your Riemannian Hessian depends on the choice of Riemannian metric. So if you choose a different Riemannian metric, the condition number might be different. Uh, and sometimes uh, vastly so. And this actually connects also with uh, something Asha talked about, which was, um, um, I think um, she called it a, a Hessian manifold, right? Where, where the, uh, the Riemannian metric you pick on Rn is actually the Hessian of a strongly convex function. Um, so, so there are certain things you can do there to choose a metric that would somehow, for your application, have a positive effect on the condition number of the Riemannian and Hessian at the minimizer. That's something you can, you can certainly do. Um, now, beyond that, there are also just um, certain Riemannian metrics that, uh, for example, would make um, would make the manifold complete. We'll see this presumably again. I haven't seen uh, Savrit's talk yet, but but I imagine this will come up um, if you optimize over the uh, the positive definite matrices. Just the set of positive definite matrices as a subset of symmetric matrices is just an open set. Uh, and so it's not, uh, if, if you think of it as, a, as an open set in, in the symmetric matrices, it's not a complete set. It's not, metrically, it's not complete. So you might move around and, and easily you know, jump outside of it. Uh, and this might cause some trouble when you optimize. Uh, but there is a way, um, a, a very pleasant way, in fact, to choose a different metric on the positive definite matrices that will make that set, com that manifold complete in a metric sense, but also in a Riemannian sense. Uh, and this, in fact, has other ramifications in um, you know, it, it can help make algorithms behave more nicely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the, the story you were trying to tell, which is at some point seem to conclude by once I've set up all this manifold uh, 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 geometry, when I want to analyze them, some algorithms, I'm basically just unfolding the same computations that I would for, for uh, uh, well, I mean, that was the only one, but so the other thing that, you know, if I do a parallel with, you know, traditional convex optimization of fat spaces, you seem to, you know, the, the statement, the, the statement that you showed us, the only concrete result that we saw was basically, you know, let's make some general assumptions on class of functions that we can tackle with the same algorithm. And uh, my question is, does this yield some results on like concrete manifolds with concrete loss functions that we could not get by just like, you know, rolling up our sleeves and going straight at it? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of things here. Um, the one is, well, I, I did very much run out of a uh, run out of time, so, so there is much more to say about this. And it's, it's certainly the case that there are all sorts of interesting optimization algorithm, algorithms on manifolds for which the analysis is not just uh, copy paste the Euclidean analysis and you know just uh, make make it go through. So there is more to it than that, and and one aspect of it is uh, to understand you know the the role that the Riemannian curvature may or may not have on the complexity of certain things. And um, you know, I, I imagine again uh, that this may come up in the, in the next presentation. Uh, but for example, acceleration is a you know is a fascinating uh, uh, topic where it seems that uh, accelerating gradient descent on negatively curved manifolds may not may not actually be possible. And so, so there there might actually be, it's all the, I mean it's a subtle question, uh, but there's this very interesting uh, preprint by uh, Hamilton and Moitra where um, you know they they make this case in an interesting setup where you see that there's an actual difference between optimizing on curved spaces and non-curved spaces. And, and, and this does come up um, you know, in, in much of the more recent literature. So it's just uh, one aside. Now for the other uh, aspect of it, which was, you, know, you were saying, can we ju not just uh, roll up our sleeves and, and, and go at it in a, you know, a head on? Um, I'm, not an, I'm not entirely sure uh, what you have in mind here, um, but, but do, do you mean to say, like write out uh, the optimization algorithm on the manifold, but ignore the, the geometry and just work out uh, um, a, a complexity result uh, by brute force. Yeah, that's right. just so a, mostly talking about the analysis, not the algorithm design, which obviously needs yeah. to 
and what's going on with the manifold? I mean, um, definitely, but, but you, you can do this for everything, right? You can always uh, express everything uh, with, uh, you know, just uh, basic uh, logic, uh, logical statements sure, and, and mean, hide all the structure. I'm, I'm asking where it's in your experience, there's like, like savings or, you know, things become more transparent once I actually work with the, the everybody in geometry. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so, definitely. Um, I mean, if, if anything, uh, it provides a framework in which to, to think about those things. And it also, you know, it allows you to, uh, just like any mathematical theory, you know, you'll have some general statements that allow you to immediately know if something, you know, you're thinking, might this be true? And if you have a good sense of uh, the general theory, then you might be uh, just uh, um, capable of answering that question much faster than if, if you have to figure it all out uh, without any backup from any, any general framework. Uh, I don't know if that made a whole lot of sense, but. Oh, it does. Uh, I think we should let people go and uh, have a break. Uh, thank you again, Nicole. This was a really informative uh, talk. And uh, we will be back at uh, 3.30 for the talk by Surit Stra. Let's thank uh, Nicole again. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you uh, at some point. <laughs>